Next, we're going to move on to uh, the cell wall of the bacterial cell. It's actually a complex, uh, semi-rigid structure that is responsible for the shape of the cell. Um, major function of the cell wall is to prevent the cell actually from rupturing due to osmotic pressure. Uh, you may remember from your earlier biology experience that plant cell walls um, serve a similar function, rigidity and osmotic pressure resistance, but they are made up of repeating glucose molecules that make up a molecule called cellulose. In the bacterial cell wall, it's made of a polymer similar to cellulose and that is made up of sugars, but it's uh, also a little bit more complex. It's known as peptidoglycan. So the peptidoglycan actually has a carbohydrate component, what's known as the glycan part, and then it also, uh, which is composed of alternating N-acetylglucosamine molecules, here circle the diagram, you can see the, the, the central uh, sugar structure right here, that ring-shaped structure, which is common to all sugars. Uh, abbreviated NAG, and then there's also an acetylmuramic acid, which is also a sugar, and again you can see that central sugar-like uh, common structure that you run across. Um, those uh, alternating NAMs and NAGs make up uh, the complex polymer uh, known as peptidoglycan. There also will be uh, peptido components shown here with the arrows, which are actually uh, alternate some uh, short polypeptides that actually link the two chains, uh, the NAM and NAG chains together and, and hold them together into a big mesh. Um, bacteria are frequently identified um, by the staining properties of their cell wall. The gram stain is one of the most common staining techniques that is used to identify the different uh, differences between the two most common types of cell walls found in bacteria. We'll be forming a gram stain this week in the lab um, on your unknown bacteria. Uh, we'll go into the details of the gram staining uh, after we look at the differences between the two major types of cell walls. The first we run into are what are known as gram positive cell walls. Gram positive bacteria have a thick layer of peptidoglycan that can be seen in the diagram here with their uh, alternating NAMs and NAGs. Uh, it's outside the plasma or cell membrane, which is shown here, the right, the plasma or cell membrane. In addition to that peptidoglycan, uh, the cell wall of the gram-positive bacteria may also contain what are known as tachoic uh, acids, which serve to anchor the layers be, uh, together and anchor them to the plasma membrane. You can see a few of them indicated here with the, the red arrows. Uh, so gram-positive cell wall is pretty simple, uh, thick peptidoglycan layer anchored with the tachoic acids. Gram-negative cells uh, tend to be a little more complex the, uh, cell wall. It's composed of several layers. There is the peptidoglycan layer, just like there is in the gram-positive cells, but you can see it's much thinner and it doesn't have the cross bridges, those peptide cross bridges. There are instead uh, lipoproteins, excuse me, uh, that bind the peptidoglycan layer to the outer membrane. Uh, outside the peptidoglycan layer is a second membrane, the outer membrane that is composed of uh, three different uh, molecules predominantly, the phospholipids, the lipopolysaccharides, and uh, porin proteins. Phospholipids are the ones that are in uh, typical membranes inside all of our cells. Right? So they are the same, the phosphate head and the lipid tail. Um, the, lipo, uh, the porin proteins provide channels through which the outer membrane for the passage of nucleotides, sugars, amino acids, vitamins, other molecules that are needed by the cell, uh, and some antibiotics also will travel through the porin proteins. The lipopolysaccharides that are themselves made up of two parts. The O polysaccharide serves as an antigen or a cell surface marker. Here's where we saw that O157 in the E. coli, O157H7. That O157 refers to a version of the O polysaccharide. Uh, the O104 and the E. coli 0104H4 obviously has a different version of that O polysaccharide. Um, the lipid A component uh, is actually uh, of the lipopolysaccharide is an endotoxin uh, and when released into a host's bloodstream or gastrointestinal tract is actually what causes much of the toxicity of the gram-negative infections such as the E. coli ones we saw in Germany this past spring or throughout the United States uh, in the last couple summers we've seen some E. coli outbreaks so as the cells die and that endotoxin gets released uh, that's what causes the, the toxicity. Uh, the periplasm 
refers to that space that exists between the two membranes. So you have the inner membrane, this plasma membrane, and that outer membrane in the periplasm uh, is that space between them. In a gram-negative cell, uh, when we talk about the cell wall, we're referring to both the peptidoglycan and that outer membrane. Uh, gram staining procedure. So now that we can see the differences in a, in a you know, microscopic view, uh, how would we recognize these in the lab? Gram stain is actually a pretty simple process that will allow for a pretty easy determination of the type of cell wall present, uh, as well as help you figure out the shape and, and arrangement that we've been looked at before. In order to do a gram stain, uh, an overnight culture is made, so it will take a 24-hour culture. That's why we're going to start our bugs the day before Thursday, so we can do our gram staining. Uh, and then that first that loopful is transferred to a slide and it's heat fixed onto the microscope slide. And then we go through a couple stains. The first stain is uh, the primary stain, which is we're going to use crystal violet. Uh, the crystal violet stains both gram positive and gram negative cells. Goes in to the cells, it's dark purple. Uh, it can get into the cytoplasm of both cell types. The next step involves adding iodine, which is known as the mordant. For those French scholars, mordant means death. Um, the iodine actually causes the crystal violet to form large insoluble crystals inside the cell. Um, these crystals are much too large to pass through the cell wall, so they get stuck inside the cell. Uh, the next step is the decolorization step, uh, which is done by uh, washing the cells with alcohol. Uh, the gram-positive stain, uh, excuse me, cells, the alcohol dehydrates that thick peptidoglycan layer and actually makes it more impermeable to the crystal violet that has been chunked up, the crystal violet iodine complex. Uh, gram-negative cells, its effect is very different. The alcohol actually dissolves the outer membrane of the gram-negative cells and leaves small holes in that thin peptidoglycan layer, which allows the crystal violet actually to wash out of the gram-negative cells, leaving them colorless. In the final step, if we wanted to see the gram-negative cells, we would have to use what's known as a counter stain, uh, something to stain that is not going to over, uh, overcome the purple, but will be able to be visible. We use a stain called safranin, which is, which is pink. Um, so in this case, you see that you have the gram-negative cells are bacillus in shape, and the gram-positive ones are cocci. And here we can see what color they would be at the various stages of the gram-staining process. Uh, this actual photograph uh, shows you some rods and cocci under a microscope, the gram-positive rods and some gram-negative uh, vibrio-shaped bugs there. Um, this last slide uh, summarizes the major differences between the two cell types. That concludes the first of the video lectures on bacterial morphology, uh, and hopefully this will start to make more sense as you experience the gram-staining and some of the identification stuff in the lab. Thanks.